Well, Garth Hewitt, uh, welcome to Fort Wayne. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. Uh, as you know, uh, we at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace have been trying to get you here uh, to Fort Wayne for a number of years now, so we're delighted that you're here. There's about a thousand questions I want to ask you, but we're going to just keep it to a few this afternoon. You call yourself a troubadour, uh, a storyteller in song is how I would describe what you do, especially about, I mean, if I think of troubadours in the medieval sense, things about passion and love. <laughs> Tell us about being a troubadour and what is it about art, do you think, especially your art of music, that's such a powerful vehicle for the work of justice? I think one of the reasons that I've sort of used Troubadour, um, and I did an album called Lonesome Troubadour, which wasn't necessarily about me, but it was picking up the aspect of um, someone who is using songs, maybe they're leaning towards poetry in their lyrics that they're writing, but they are committed um, and the, the justice issues that seem to be coming, that I was coming face to face with, seem to be right for that thoughtful kind of approach to music. Um, not that it all has to be gentle music, but that it has to be strong and be reflecting the issues that we're talking about. And um, I kind of like the, the word true, but in fact, I'm a, a, about to do a few concerts with a friend, and it's going to be called The Poet and the Troubadour. He's a very good poet, Martin Rose, so we're going to do a few things. You, you trace your awareness of social issues, at least one of the formative influences, to a sermon you heard as a teenager in St. Paul's mm -hmm. Cathedral in London by Martin Luther King Jr. when he was on his way to Oslo uh, to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Tell us about that sermon and its impact on you as a young teenage boy. It had a huge impact on me. I, I was thinking about um, Christianity. How did it relate to me? I was brought up in a Christian home. I was kind of happy with it. It wasn't a big tortured deal. But I was sort of wondering where it fitted in, in the world, in the life um, that I was looking at and so on. And then I saw this guy on television. He's kneeling on the ground. He's praying in front of police who are setting dogs and water cannon onto him and so on. And I suddenly thought, this is somebody who lives it out. And it actually, I can hear it's making the whole message of spirituality tangible. This is how you should live. This is uh, activism, what I'd probably describe as reflecting Jesus the activist now. And so when I saw he was coming to St. Paul's Cathedral, I, I said to my friends, Martin Luther King's coming. Do you want to come with me? No, they said. And <laughs> they hadn't quite been impacted in that way. So off I went on my own on that day. And he talked about the wholeness of spirituality, of loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, loving your neighbor as yourself, and into that bit, of course, he started to address the lifestyle of justice that was a way of living, expressing your love for your neighbor. And suddenly it was making sense for me. This ah. made the Christianity that I'd been brought up with, it suddenly made sense. It was the actions, and why I was frustrated at that point, not quite seeing it, was because I didn't see the actions. Um, I hadn't heard um, quite what he was saying. And I thought to myself... I don't know quite how to live this out, but my aim should be to be living this out in some way at some point. It took me a little bit of time. Of course it did, because it was a very big issue I was presented with. But suddenly uh, it was making sense. And so after a few years, I went forward for ordination in the Anglican Church, and I felt that I was heading in a direction that um, had been inspired by that moment. You gave a, a talk once, probably more than once, but I saw, I did a little research and I saw this YouTube of a, a brief talk, an excerpt of a talk you gave about two women who changed the course of history, specifically Martin Luther King Jr.'s history, Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955, 
And the other one, do you remember? At the Lincoln Memorial, August 28th, 1963, Mahalia Jackson. Yes. Tell us about these two women who changed the course of history. Well, um, the Mahalia Jackson situation was one I hadn't known, but she called out at his, that um, his I Have a Dream speech, you know, or before he, he spoke the I Have a Dream speech. I... Um, I've been following him. I've been very inspired by her and uh, her music and her songs and the spirituality of it. But it was a journalist who wrote a book for the 50th anniversary of this speech, Gary Young, who told me that she had called out, tell him about the dream, Martin. Up, up until that point, it was sort of cookie cutter, King kind of rehearsing a lot of what he had said previously. And then she Maybe, says... Maybe, yeah, yes. It wasn't taking off. And... and I think even the hot weather and they were tired, it was the end of the day. I think this is all part of it. And the performer in Mahalia Jackson, she knows what story he has to tell. Tell him about the dream. So he pushes aside his papers and uh, Gary Young put it, he took up a preacher's stance at the podium. And we got that speech, which has been so important. And I kind of chuckled, and I wrote a song about it, tell him about the dream, Martin, because I thought it's, it was the musician <laughs> that was sensitive <laughs> to what was needed at that point. And I really believe that, and I believe he looked to her very much as someone who was a, a great example and so on. But you, can you imagine someone just changing their whole thing? But it rang the bell. He knew, I must give that speech. Yeah. Rosa Parks, you want to say a word? Oh, Rosa Parks. Um, the fact that she didn't give up her seat, um, the fact of being prepared, uh, that there's a, there are moments to say no. There are moments to say, this is it, that's far enough. And she was someone who saw the moment, and of course, as a result of this, the whole, um, what was it called, bus boycott happened as a result. Um, and... I think it brought Martin Luther King very much to the Absolutely. forefront. Absolutely. So it was this amazing, wise person who, at the right moment, thought, "No, not this time. I don't. I'm not giving in." This was Rosa Parks before she was Rosa Parks, right? I mean, she was. She wasn't one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. This no, was a woman no. who just said no. She enough. said no. She had enough. And I would take that as a, a spiritually prophetic moment. She saw this. This is it now. The time to say no, and um, the effect of it was huge. You founded and just retired after serving more than twenty-five years as the director of the human rights charity Amos Trust. You've got partnerships in Palestine, South Africa, Nicaragua, Burundi, India, Tanzania, and beyond. I'm tempted to ask you to just tell us all about Amos Trust, but that's a big question. When I read your biographical notes, you chose the prophet Amos as the namesake for this organization that you were founding. Tell us about why Amos. Well, the Amos is well known for that, particularly that verse, let justice roll on like a river and right living like an ever um, flowing stream. So justice should be integrated through what we did. But there was something else, because in the early days, um, I was obviously a musician. We were also working with quite a, quite a few mus musicians in different countries. And if you look at the verses in Amos, just before that Amos 5.24 bit, you see that music gets criticized if they're doing music and ignoring the poor. And it's the only place in the Bible where music is criticized. And it's criticized if you're not listening to the the injustice and the poverty and just singing your music. It could be, it's not quite clear, it could be music in worship that's being criticized. And I think either way, whether it's music in worship or whether it's music in whatever setting, if you're ignoring the issues of justice, then uh, that's not acceptable. And that's what Amos is saying. And so it seemed to me that particularly because our roots were in the music at that time, but also, um, yeah, the strong call to justice, which we wanted to reflect. 
in addition to your advocacy for justice in Palestine, I mean, you stand and write music, you stand with and write music for many of the folks who live on the margins uh, around the world. I'd like for you to say a word about two other peoples close to your heart, refugees and uh, India's Dalits. Those are very big issues, and we're seeing the refugee issue um, increasing. It's always been big, but increasing and increasing. Partly increasing because um, the certainly in my country, which I can speak about um, better, the attempt to stop um, refugees coming. And often there isn't a looking at what's caused the refugees. They don't look at the wars that bombed with shock and awe that cause refugees. Um, and so there's this sort of, why should they come here kind of thing. Um, a boat came into the little town where we live with refugees, and people were there chanting, go away. Um, but the lifeguard people, they rescued the boat, and they spoke passionately about the rightness of doing that, and they were shocked the people who were chanting like that. And it's people starting to feel they are entitled when who caused all of these situations? How can we therefore um, be committed to justice? And I wrote a song, it's called Little Boy Down. And it was, I was watching the television it's news. It's a famous, famous photograph, wasn't it, of that little boy? Yes. Please. A little, I, w I was watching the television news when um, one of these lifeguards pulls this little lad out of the water. And he's dead. And his name, um, it'll come to me in a moment. The, um, and I thought, here we are on a beautiful beach. He's just been rescued, but he's died. And so, um, and the song starts off about this little boy down. And it could be down on the beach, I say. Oh, he could be playing on the beach. That's what should be going on. But it's not what's going on. And so um, I wanted people to feel the personal challenge. It's to do with all of us, this one. Dalits, it's a little more complicated because of its coming out of the caste system within India situation. It exists outside India, of course, as well. But um, the I was asked by an Indian, uh, a guy called Paul Devarka, who heads up the human rights organization for Dalits, and he asked if I would write a song on... <coughs> he gave me a Dalit drum, and the Dalits use the drum. Um, it's partly a sign of their oppression, that uh, the skin of an animal and only these Dalits outcasts or whatever they're being called, can play this. And they turn it into an instrument of victory, an instrument of power, really. Um, and so I did an album called Dalit Drum with a friend of mine, Paul Field. And we went and saw for ourselves, we went into the villages, we saw what upper caste people were doing every day to um, young Dalit women often and to the whole Dalit community. And actually, in the in the current week we're talking about, we've heard of Dalit women being killed within India. That's right. And it's just in the news all the time. But it's when we start to say that one group or another is better than the other. In other words, the, the, it comes back. So much justice comes back to equality. Treat people with equality. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. And um, somehow... Don't ignore the ones who get pushed pushed away. Um, we maybe don't hear a lot about it. We don't read a lot about it. Well, we need to join groups who are reading about it and speaking about it and helping people to um, focus on a situation that's very, very sad. Um, so I believe the voices need to be heard and the, the Dalit drums need to be beaten. I wasn't aware of that, about the Dalit drums. I mean, it's really a story of, I mean, if you look at it from the Christian perspective, I mean, it's really a cross and resurrection. It turned defeat into victory. It turned despair into hope. It, exactly that, because this... You, it's like a Dalit playing, theology. Yeah, because they're, a, you know, they, um, they can play that. The upper caste can't touch that. 
but they turn it into something. I, I was in villages listening to the playing. We recorded a lot of the playing, uh, which we put behind the songs we did on the album, because it was so exhilarating. It, it, and victory is there in it, a refusal just to give in and be treat, mistreated. Your ties to Palestine are deep. Uh, we first met at, in 2006 at, at your consecration as honorary canon at St. George's Anglican Cathedral in East Jerusalem by our uh, friend Bishop Ria. Also in 2006, the House of Poetry in Ramullah awarded you a certificate of appreciation for your songs on Palestine. Mm. You've got children in Bethlehem, I read. Yes. Um, I also know you were originally moved by Blood Brothers, authored by our dear friend, uh, retired Archbishop, our dear Abuna, Elias Shakur, uh, who's spoken here in Fort Wayne four times, uh, by the way. And I used to be on his Pilgrims of Ibeline board here in the uh, U.S. for six years. Mm. So tell us about this. I mean, once, I always feel like once once I take people there, they're hooked because the people are so hospitable, the issues are so clear. Uh, tell us about your your deep connection to Palestine. Interestingly, it didn't start by going there, although I agree with you, and it should, come and see is the message of Absolutely. Palestinian Christians. But I'm sitting in Uganda in the home of a friend of mine who was the bishop of Namarembe called Miseri Kauma. And he's not there, and I'm just reading some of his, a magazine that was there. And it's talking about the Palestinians. But in a way, I have never heard. I've heard, I thought, I don't really know much about them. I've heard, you know, if, what people have said, which is often rude about the Palestinians or whatever, or offensive. And as I read this, I thought, I've, I've just simply not grasped this. And I'm now on the equator, virtually. <laughs> it's as if you're hearing a, a voice from the other side of the equator. And um, so when I went back, uh, I went to try and find some material on it. But ironically, it was in London Airport, Heathrow, that I came across a book by Abuna Elias Shakur called Blood Brothers. And it's a superb book that tells the story in a way that's very helpful about uh, how his village... Um, was attacked when the um, Israelis came in in '48, and you, you just as you're reading, you keep saying, "I did, I never knew, I never knew," and so then we invited him to a festival called the Greenbelt Festival in Britain. Uh, first year he wasn't allowed out to come to it. Second year he got there. We almost lost his talk because he was, they forgot to pick him up at the hotel. <laughs> but then um, he came. And it impacted people to an extent that the, the festival has had things about Palestine and the situation in Israel for almost every year since. And he said to me at the festival, come and do this in Galilee. I said, whoa, yes, I'd like to. I've not been. It was, that was the come and see for me. And then a, a Christian organization in Britain said to me when they heard a song I'd written called... Um, Where's the land of Palestine? They said, we've worked there for over a hundred years. We'll get the local bishop to invite you and come and see. And uh, it was Bishop Samir Kafiti. And I went and discovered the story. I discovered friendships that are really very strong. And again, the word equality comes to mind. I think we cannot solve this situation without equality. And... Um, it's something that I think is the, the, the response is deeply needed at the moment because of the constant ignoring and writing out of history and everything of the Palestinians. We have a number of mutual friends, Garth, uh, in Palestine, Israel. I'm going to name just three. And after each one, I'd just like for you to say a word about them. I, the founder of the Israel Committee Against House Demolitions and the co-founder of the One Democratic State campaign, Jeff Halper. <laughs> Jeff, I was just with at the Greenbelt Festival <coughs> this year. He was there speaking powerfully, as he always does. And Jeff is one of those people who sits down in front of bulldozers and says no um, when homes are being de demolished. When I 
first started going to Palestine, I was saying to the dean of St. George's Cathedral, I said, I need it. I, I need to speak with a Jewish person to help me understand things. Um, I'm not clear enough on some of the issues. And he said, well, talk to Jeff Halper. So I talked to Jeff, got him to talk to our groups and did regularly. Um, and he has been a, a constant imp inspiration. He speaks clearly, he sees it clearly. And um, so to me, he he's now campaigning for one state because of equality. He believes in equality. So um, as someone that, that certainly I've been inspired by and would like others to hear and, and uh, also be inspired by. The founder of the Arawad Cultural and Theatre Arts Centre in the Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem, uh, Abdel Fattah Abusror. Abed. Yeah, Abed, Abdel Fattah. Um, you know, I'm biased. When a person is a poet, I'm biased towards him. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a poet. And some of his poems are so powerful and truthful. And he's in working in uh, a refugee camp, which is a place where they say has been the most tear-gassed place on earth. And there they are. And what are they doing? They are doing art and creativity he uses the phrase beautiful resistance. They are doing peacemaking, beautiful resistance, and the creativity and the art um, and the poems. They just inspire. And so, again, another example uh, for people to go and visit, to listen to, to read. Um, his way of telling the story is very important and very powerful. The last time you and I saw each other was uh, at Arawad. You had a group there, and I had a group there. Mm. And you sang the song, Beautiful Resistance. That was the first you time had just written. I'd just written it, yes. I, and it was, um, I wasn't sure how it would be received and so on, so I, I sang it. And then I popped upstairs afterwards, looking around the place, and I heard it. And they recorded me, I didn't know they <laughs> and they were playing it back. And I, th I thought, this is nice, because, of course, the key thing is, if you're going to write a song about someone's situation or whatever, uh, do they like it? Are, is it? Have you spoken the truth? And if they accept it, you think, oh, good, I'm, I believe I've spoken the truth. The beautiful thing about Abed is you know, when we hosted him here, he had just come from South Carolina, North Carolina, I can't remember, but he had been invited to, you know, he's all about the theater. I mean, that's his yeah. theater and poetry. Yeah. And he had been invited to direct a play oh, yes. for a group of young people at this at this uh, art center. And the play was The Diary of Anne Frank. Amazing. Mm. Suffering yeah. knows no, I mean, transcends, right? Yes. Uh, that, ethnic, uh, ethnicity. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't see that. But when I heard that, I thought, oh, that's, that is... Fantastic and important. Uh, the other person I'd like for you to say a word about, uh, um, uh, and we owe him a lot here, uh, the founder, again, of the WEAM, Palestine Conflict Resolution and Transformation Center in Bethlehem. Yeah. Our friend uh, Zugby Zugby. Zugby Zugby. He, he, that guy has the knack of saying things. Um, I mustn't be around him too much because there's so many of his little quotes I can take and turn into songs. <laughs> <laughs> and I've done it. <laughs> and one of the ones I've done uh, is called No Injustice Will Last Forever. And it was on a day, he asked me if I would plant a tree and they're making a little arboretum. Um, I mean, you know, over 87% of uh, Bethlehem's land has been taken and the, the green land is sort of not left. So... They're, they're trying to do some planting uh, right there um, in their little centre, which is beside the huge separation wall. And um, he asked me to do this, and then he gave me a T-shirt. And on the <laughs> T-shirt it said, No Injustice Will Last no Forever. No way. And I thought, that that is a song. And I often finish concerts with it, because how do you, to get someone who produces hope out of a context like that that appears so hopeless... That is a prophetic figure, and um, he's a very humorous figure. I, I love him, and I'm inspired by him. 
central to your music and social justice advocacy, and you referenced it earlier a little bit, uh, is your Christian faith. You describe your latest album, Easter Revolution, like this. It's a revolution of peacemaking, of following Jesus the peacemaker, a revolution that rejects violence as a solution, rejects greed, and embraces justice for all, sharing with all, and welcoming the forgotten. It's a call for equality. Recognizing our responsibility to care for the planet, it is a revolution of hope. So you tie this revolution of hope, Garth, to following Jesus, the peacemaker, the rebel, the rebel, and you call it Easter Revolution. I think if we look at Holy Week, Jesus riding into Jerusalem, um, the behavior of Jesus that week is extraordinary in terms of the nonviolence, in terms of um, his commitment to making peace. And of course, then what happens to him, he, he pays for it with his life and um, the disciples are bewildered really. They, they haven't fully understood the whole um, side of what Jesus was saying. But he... Um, he brings hope in what he does on that we that hope still lives on and challenges people to be the peacemakers that make a difference and um, I find therefore that for me that the power of the Christian message comes back to this Jesus the activist and if we can follow Jesus I hope it doesn't always lead to crucifixion but there may be times of enormous difficulty but to do what's right to show the values of hope and healing and justice that is the is a huge message and a lifestyle and I said Easter revolution because this album isn't just for Easter because the record company said well when do you want to release this? I said, oh, just release it for Christmas. They said, no, no, it won't sell then. I said, well, see, the thing is, the Easter message doesn't stop after Easter. It's for all the year round. So we even put that on some of the advertising. Um, Easter revolution, the Easter message for all the year round. So um, that, I hope, is reflecting the life-changing message and, and hope of Easter. One last question. In your book, The Road Home, with art artist uh, Daniel Bunnell, you include the song, On the Other Side, inspired by the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it strikes me, Garth, that this song lies at the heart of your life's work and at your heart. And I want to just, just give me a second. I'm going to read the couple of verses mm. and then the refrain. It's so easy not to notice the victims in the weak or to hear the quiet voices of the forgotten and the meek. Not to reach out in love, but to turn our heads and hide. But he wouldn't pass by on the other side. There was a world that was wounded, a world torn apart. But love for that world was so close to his heart. It was love that drove him. It was for love he died because... He wouldn't pass by on the other side. And then the refrain. So don't pass by on the other side. Or turn your head. Or run away and hide. Or leave your neighbor by the roadside. Don't pass by on the other side. To me, that's Garth Hewitt. And the voice that you bring to injustice in Palestine, but also around the world. Tell us about, if you want that song, how in, you know, your life's work. That's Garth Hewitt to me. <laughs> the temptation is to pass by on the other side, isn't it? It's, it's there. Um, and the example of Jesus was, no, you don't do that. Don't do that. And we're all tempted by it, I think. Um, and we would like to be more comfortable. And the irony is, walk the right way, right? walk the way of caring for the forgotten and the oppressed, and you'll make some awfully good friends. And 
you'll see that life can be a transforming time of encounter, hope, love, justice. All of these good qualities come out of the suffering situations. But if you walk by on the other side, you're smaller for that. You know, we're, we're all become smaller for that. There's something to do. There's a task to be done. And let's all give that a good go. Garth Hewitt, thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. A voice cries out in the wilderness I hear her call but I don't know her name The voice cries again in the wilderness My name is Palestine I will remain She's holding a flag so very high